Hey there, everybody. It's F Percussion Podcast. It's episode 299. You're probably listening on release date, which is September 30th. My name is Casey Cangelosi. And here, as usual, I've got my co host, Ben Charles, is here. Hey, Casey. How are you? Good. Thanks, Ben. Also, Ksenia Komjanovic is here. Hey, Ksenia. I like to make you stumble. <laughs> Hi, Casey. I like to make what? You stumble. Stumble. Stutter. Oh, yes. well, yeah. <laughs> Ksenia Komnovakovic is here. <laughs> and also Carly Vina is here. You did well with my name. Hey, Casey. I know. I was thinking, how can I make Carly's funny? And it didn't, didn't come to mind. But yeah. yep. Yeah, hey, hey, fun. good. Good to see you all. Well, like I said, you know, it is September 30th we're releasing. And uh, just real quick, happy birthday to our famous cussing uh, drummer of the century, demeaning, shouting, yelling, Buddy Rich, 1917, uh, and also one of the like best drummers in the world. And um, gosh, I reported many episodes ago about how there's actually a running Seinfeld joke about Buddy Rich and not about what a like amazing drummer he is, but about the infamous Buddy Rich tapes and how he would uh, yell at his his musicians and how he would intimidate them and, and really bully them into submission on his bus. And if you've never heard this, it's it's interesting. But yeah, like that has really gone above and beyond like what his, of course, like you know, phenomenal musicianship has gone to all the way into a Seinfeld episode, which they never explain, but Google it, look it up, Buddy Rich tapes, Jerry Seinfeld, you'll find this like interesting, funny connection, um, or go back and listen on our old episode. And the other thing, 1935, first performance of George Gershwin's Porgy and Bess. So it turns out like there's more to this opera than just that excerpt. You guys, you know, the Xylophone excerpt. It turns out there's like a whole other, it's like an entire opera and it's about all this stuff and there's like a story. And I guess there's even more music after the excerpt. This is not known, widely not known to, to, to most of us. But uh, a few fun facts about Porgy and Bess. And the end best, it was originally just going to be called Porgy. But the end best was added later. And apparently this was to separate it from, I guess, the book it was inspired by, um, which I didn't find the title of. Maybe it's just called Porgy, but uh, was, was to further separate it from that. And also, I guess, to make it sound more sellable as an opera. So Tristan and Isolde, Dido and Aeneas, Peleos and Melisande. So I guess they thought Porgy and Bess sounded more like, I don't know, grand opera. But however, like I think of a lot of other operas, it's like Carmen, single, single name, um, Tosca, sing, single name. I don't know. Like, like there's plenty of, of, of fall staff. You know, there's like there's like a bazillion single name ones. So I don't know. I thought that was uh, that was interesting. Yeah, Ben. Oh, I was going to two two facts about Porgy and Bess. One, Casey, I'm disappointed that you didn't mention in an eighth grade all county band. I performed the Porgy and Bess medley, so that was pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> That's coming up. How do you know? I'm not done. How do you know I wasn't getting? Oh, okay. well, getting sorry, that. sorry to end. Yeah, uh, and then the other thing, as I was going to say, uh, maybe you were going to say this, but but I'll I'll steal it from you. Uh, Eric Samu has a, a very cool uh, variations on Porgy and Bess arrangement on marimba. That's uh, extremely difficult that everyone should check out sometime. I saw him play it once and it was just Me extraordinary. Too. Yeah. Oh man. Yeah. And I remember seeing the title thinking like, this can't be that good. Porgy, the various Porgy was, and it was just so good. And yeah, now goes like, yeah, like not a lot of, lot of major right? sevenths in that one. <laughs> it's, it's it just looks hard. <laughs> yeah. Just really, really good. Uh, just a few more fun facts. This opera premiered on Broadway with 125 runs, which you think like for an opera, that's really great, but it was first considered a flop because on Broadway, 125 apparently is, is not very many. Um, you think when you compare it to musicals um, and real, real big popular shows happening. So good for opera, not great for Broadway. One fun fact, the lead actor, Todd Duncan, staged a protest of segregation against what's the, the National Theater. I guess the theater was originally intending to have a blacks only ticketed show. So a show set aside for a black audience only that they could buy tickets, but Duncan and the rest of the cast uh, boycotted it. They said, no, we're not going to perform under the guise of tickets that will be sold by any race. And Todd's, Todd Duncan was a black actor. So it's cool. They said, like, no, 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 we won't perform when there is tickets sold based on race, uh, even if it's for black folks only. So that was um, that was cool. It's something they did together. And the the um, the theater uh, 
went for their demands and and let everyone into the show and i guess it was always a pretty good mixed audience let's see uh and, and along the same lines gershwin insisted that it could only be sung by a black cast so this is a tradition that apparently launched the careers of several prominent black opera singers george gershwin sought to write a true opera and felt that the met staff singers couldn't master the genre so the metropolitan opera seems like the more we talk about the met on the show the more we realize we just hate the Met. The Met's just a terrible thing, and apparently they can't sing jazz now either. So anywho, uh, let's see what else. It's been on Broadway seven times, despite that initial supposed failure. It's been produced on Broadway in 1935, 1942, 43, 44, 53, 76, 83, and 2012. The 2012 production was 320 performances long. And summertime, the song, right? Summertime. Take it, Ben. I got uh, nothing, but I was uh, going to say that uh, Percussion Group Cincinnati has a cool version of uh, Summertime also. <laughs> uh, well, speaking of the <laughs> Three dudes on one road, that's the point, actually. It's been, it's been, what do they say? It has been covered 33,000 times by various groups and solo performers. 33,000 times. So, One of anyway. those times is me and Felipe playing it on bassoon and marimba. That's oh, right. Wow. <laughs> That's right. And I think, yeah, if I click the tab on the three thirty-three thousand, it lists every single. No, just kidding. You know, that's great. That's cool, Carly. I didn't. I didn't know y'all did that. Well, hey, that is y'all's news for the day. So, yep. Think about those things today on release date, September thirtieth. And now, welcome to our fantastic guest, y'all. This episode is supposed to be about kind of how to develop your love and passion for marimba and how that might be uh, a career. And I can't think of a better person to ask. This person has absolutely done it. She's performed all over the world. Um, Carnegie Hall, uh, Lincoln Center, just you name it, she's, she's done it. Uh, Tokyo, uh, the, those cool places in New York, everything. She's sponsored by Yamaha. She's sponsored by Encore Mallets, and she teaches at the University of Southern California. If you dabble in marimba or even percussion, you probably have heard of uh, the very fantastic and wonderful Naoko Takata. Hey, Naoko, how's it going? I'm good. How about you? I'm good. Thanks. I survived the, the music history lesson this morning. Um, oh, I made a note on it. Thank you so much. I'm already cool. learning a lot. That's good. That's so good. Um, yep. Yep. Cool news for the day. Lucky. I got really lucky that there was a cool one. Now, we, we really want to ask you, like, I, I feel like there's so many percussionists out there that like, you know, they're just like enthralled with marimba and we all really love marimba. And a, a lot of times people outside of percussion, you know, that they, they, at least for me, they don't understand my love for marimba. They say like, well, marimba is like not in orchestra. It's not in jazz band. It's not in, and when it is in wind symphony, like you don't hear it. Why do you guys study marimba so much? So I guess my, my question for you is like, what do you, what do you think is just so like gripping and enthralling and enticing about the marimba to so many of us? And of course, including yourself. I think um, my experience was, you know, I, I was eight and I saw the marimba for the first time. That was a girls festival day in Japan. And the lady was playing the flight of the bumblebee and it was like, and she looks elegant and beautiful and, but it's acrobatic. I didn't uh, register as, um, you know, music. I thought it was like entertainment. Then she began to play some choral. I had no idea what that piece was, but it's so soothing, melancholic. I was eight, but I was in tears. So uh, the instrument has such a beautiful sounds. Like it's so unique and overtones like you know, after you're playing all the percussion, when I play marimba, I just, it resonates me to my soul and to my heart. And so uh, for me, I knew that would be my instrument, but you know, as many of us, we uh, experiment with, uh, I was drummer in high school. I was a school's accompanist on the piano. And I tried to sing, teacher said, you have no talent. 
And, you know, I keep trying, even try the Japanese taiko. I, I thought, well, use the culture and be the star. Didn't happen. So like a trial and a failure, trial, failure. I majored in a psychology. Uh, in fact, I was psychology major till my junior year. So, you know, it's like trial, failure, trial, failure. And when I came to United States, uh, that was more like accident. I asked the music office, uh, marimba is my hobby. How can I get access? Then they signed me up for the orchestra audition, which I had no idea, my bad English. So I just, you know, she knew I wasn't aware of what she was actually saying. So it gave me the, you know, the time and the room and, then I just show up with a card, and uh, uh, that was uh, uh, Mr. Lee from the CSUN, Cal State University in Northridge. He said, point out the timpani and asked me to play. I'm like, I never played timpani, but I couldn't say, so I hit a couple. Then he said, you know, uh, you play the cymbal. I never played the cymbal, couldn't say, so I hit some, and he said, softer, softer, softer. Didn't play, he said that. Awesome. And then I played marimba. Of course I played well. I'm like, I know this. <laughs> so after one year studying psychology, actually, I, I was uh, taking all the orchestra and history classes in the music. I get in trouble later. But um, I decided to quit my Japanese university and transfer as a music student in that point. So I didn't realize marimba or the music was going to be my career till really late. I was all, already uh, 21 when I changed my major. So I really relate to the people who are like, oh, well, you play marimba. And it's, I really understand. But I, I think uh, when you decide to major in percussion, you just have to decide to love. It, there's no question about it. Uh, you don't like marimba. You have too much doubt too long. Um, I think uh, behavioral uh, therapy, I guess we would say, you just jump in and play and see how it feels. More you get into it and more you know it, then the love come. You never, uh, people say love in first sight, it's like, loving it for sight with marimba. You just don't know it until you get to learn some. So give it a chance. Um, yeah, give it a chance. That's I would say for most of the students who are mainly drummers um, have trouble reading and they get frustrated. Speaking of it, it kind of feels like, I know when I was a kid, it really felt like drumming, like drum set was the first thing I did the most. And marimba sort of felt like, wow, I have all these voices and I have all this coordination to deal with. And just like you have four limbs, you have four mallets. And I wonder if people are so attracted to it because it just, it finally feels like we're playing. I mean, there's not like, like you can't do counterpoint on the tambourine um, in orchestra. You can't do counterpoint on the triangle. You can't do counter. I mean, you might be counterpoint in the context of the larger section, but it's, I don't know, it's like for forever, we've been in these conversations about music, about form and um, thematic relationships and all this stuff. It's like, well, if you're just playing snare drum, like a lot of that stuff is, is hard to latch onto. But now all of a sudden we can talk to it, to, we can be in the conversation with everyone at like the same level. You know, all of a sudden, like all that talk that uh, pianists have had for <laughs> hundreds of years, like we can now like that has a relevance to to like a direct relevance. I know like you can talk about snare drum in like a very analytical way, of course, but like um, all of a sudden that has a relevance to us maybe. And so it just seems like it's so popular for for percussionists and they they love it so much. Uh, just a theory yeah. I have. And that leads me to a. Uh... Why well, want to ask? So most of the students who come to me, they want to be marimbas, right? Or they want to use marimba as orchestra audition or whatever. But the, for the marimbas who totally into marimba, I have a hard time 
for them to open up to other percussion instruments. Uh, my philosophy is if you are a freshman and undergraduate and you major music, just become a versatile percussionist first. Give a chance to every single instrument and just focus and learn, then complain, but not before, right? But I just have a, many students who come to me is a kind of reverse. They already have passion to marimba and they have trouble loving snare. And the snare is always so crucial. Right. Yeah, cool. Well, well said. Well, that leads us right into the second question, which is, you know, what, what do we advise for those young folks who really want to do what you've done? Like they, they want to have a, a solo performance career, not as a percussionist, but as a marimbist. And they want to play all over the world like you have, you know, what, what exactly do they do? Do they get really good first? And then do they get an agent? Do they do a competition? What, what should they do? I have like a five general ideas to uh, in this category. Probably I talk a lot in here. Uh, the first thing is uh, you have to know the statistics of how how many percent you have to win. And there are so many people who wants to get the spot and probably one spot per. Uh, there's a two big uh, soloist competition in the United States that's open for the world. And that's uh, YCA, Young Concert Artist uh, International Audition, which I, I won, Pius Chan won, uh, and Makoto Nakura won. Then the other one is the CAG, like Svet and uh, it's new. Uh, Nietzsche mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Oh, yes, that's right. So uh, those two auditions are, were my target audition. And it's still, I think. And for those auditions, uh, the judges do not hear you until you have uh, uh, like uh, winning in other competitions. So they only hear you when there's opening, plus they have a good resume of winnings. So it's, so my first advice is know that and have a like one year plan to get the repertoire ready. One, you have to win concert competition. So you have experience, you can be soloist. Not only just solo, it's such a different genre to playing with the orchestra. You gotta uh, study the score. Then, you know, solo marimba, it's different. And other thing you have to do is having a five solo repertoire. And one is usually have to be Bach. So either you are gonna do the complete Bach cello suite, which I suggest it's, kind of easiest to read, right? Not necessarily the easiest to uh, interpret. Then another thing is a violin sonata and partita. I did the one with a whole complete uh, partita, which has a chacon. And uh, the other popular one uh, last five years, I would say is the lute suite. So you have to learn one of them by heart, no music then you have to learn uh, four other contemporary works in different styles. And I had to research what I played and the one I used for the audition was, uh, where did it? Uh, Velocities by Schwantner, then um, Nodan Lights by Erika Weizen. Those two I chose as a living composer and we are like uh we we play their piece they live they get the benefit we get the benefit we get more audience so those things are very important uh if you are auditioning in it's in new york so new york audition uh playing a, a living composer's pieces then i play back then uh also, I played uh, Mirage, which kind of represent my culture. I was hoping uh, by playing that piece, I can show what differentiate from other players, which I can do with the space. Instead of the rest, we have the concept of the ma, like a uh, kind of like zen. <laughs> so, empty empty uh, space that the audience yeah. fills with their own impression. Yeah, I remember. So I chose that. Then uh, if you cannot memorize those pieces, then, you know, 
there's no chance. So first step is memorize all those five repertoire and win a concert competition. And just to be clear, it doesn't have to be those particular pieces. It just has to, they just have to have the contrast. Yes, a uh, contrast. Not, uh, sometimes my students come with a contrast and kind of like fun, easy listening piece. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not necess necessarily like that. So mm -hmm. uh, Merlin, Velocity, Nippelheim, and those pieces have fast hands, but there's so you can do so much to show I can differentiate. So it's not like you pick a slow piece or some fun sounding piece. You, it's a soloist competition. You have to show yourself off in a given time, which they don't give you much. They'll stop you before the main part, which you practice like hours on it. Yeah, right, right, right. One, one other thing, you know, you mentioned suggesting cello suites for Bach. Um, what other variables do you do you take into account when picking which Bach? I feel like some of my students, they just go like, I don't know, they, they spend a really long time trying to pick the right one. And a yes. lot of times I feel like, well, you can kind of do what you need. With, just kind of just please pick one and go, you know? Right. I think the efficiency of keeping the repertoire, you have to play from memory. So knowing that, my partita is so long. I thought Chacon has such effect. That was my passion. I feel that was wrong. Because that, that piece itself, I mean, lifetime, right? <laughs> so uh, if I chose the uh, maybe shorter, complete sonata, then I can spend so much more time to differentiate and making sure each piece speak to the judges. And first audition, you probably do not win knowing the stat. So you have to keep that repertoire at least three years, possibly eight, depending, until you give up. So uh, just remember, you have to keep memorizing, keep up with all the repertoire, then decide. Yep. Gotcha. 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 Well, uh, all right. Well, once you, you are to this, you know, wonderful place where you're performing in front of audiences, how do you approach repertoire balance? Cause I've seen you play some like wildly contemporary stuff like Mirage. And I've also seen you play, like, I remember you playing Sejourne Academia and it, you were in like high heels, you know, uh, eight inches tall and you were just having like the most fun in the world playing it and um yeah i don't know like like what do you how, how important is it to balance you know your contemporary I was, classical uh, rep i was um, checking out her pink panther as well <laughs> there's also that one yeah that's right <laughs> like yeah you do a good job of that <laughs> thank you uh so there that piece pink panther it's like uh it's not coming from my my heart it's just uh you know the audience requested i want to hear the pink panther i want to hear this i want to hear this and pink panther I'm like oh i kind of like that so uh all the my favorite things you know there was a request from general audience i i just wonder if you can play those just pieces on marine like hmm, it's a good idea but those things come after becoming a marinist so uh, the young students who, let's say they watch my concert and they're like, oh, that was so cool. I want to do that. But uh, if they want to be marimbas, uh, they have to love contemporary. If they don't, just decide now and do it. So it's, uh, I, I know that conflict, but if you, your passion is so strong, then you just jump on it. Contemporary pieces gonna give you the winning so you just have to uh love it if you love it congratulations just to choose the piece that shows off your talents and possibly in the first one minute if that piece doesn't like develop until like five minutes like uh, most pieces are mm -hmm. do something about first one minute 
because they hear the first one and it's for sure. I think about that when judging. Yeah, you can usually tell within a minute or so, like, like where where your opinion lies on a on a candidate. Sorry, I think Ben, you had something. Oh yeah, I was going to say I I think I told this story on the podcast a long time ago, but there was one time it was a weird story. But when I was in Miami, I got booked to play. I think it was an eighty year old woman's birthday party. She just Ooh. loved the marimba, and she saw a public performance I did, and she wanted me to play at her birthday party for like an hour. Um, and one thing, like, I, first of all, I was like, okay, I don't know anything that's like birthday party appropriate. <laughs> but Ref second, reflections of all, like, on the nature of water. Yeah, right. Yeah. No. Yeah. Um, and ripple. I, if only that was in my repertoire. Um, but then, second of all, I realized, like, we like we worked really hard to play something like like you mentioned, Mirage, and we can make Mirage sound good. And like, there's that thing we kind of say that like it's maybe like a little too true for us, but it's like, listen, if you miss a note in Mirage, no, no one's going to know. <laughs> but if you arranged happy birthday for like four mallets with like playing the harmony, you know, not a chorale, but actually like playing, playing, you know, uh, articulated notes. If you miss a note, ev everyone knows <laughs> and it sounds bad. And it's really hard to make something like as simple as happy birthday sound not elementary because uh, you're just sort of plunking out chords and notes but then if you miss a note it sounds so bad it's it's so difficult to play like the easiest of music well and there's like a few pieces like uh kikwabe timber uh not timber and shinwa what's uh timber and paraphrase uh that it's like a pop sounding marimba tune that actually lays really well on the instrument obviously she arranged it so it so it works but uh, yeah, Nauko, it's like in your experience, like, is it, it, do you find it really difficult even to play like simple music like that? Because we're so used to forgiveness for missing a note, and there's so few people that don't miss notes when they play the marimba. Yes, I have many experiences. I embarrassed myself. I even announced the audience, I'm gonna mess up. <laughs> so, uh, I think uh, many of us suddenly the audience said, Can you play this or? play something that's like scary experience for the when I was in my 20s no I need like at least like one week notice <laughs> but yeah um like playing for kids too like what what like what do we play <laughs> right so um as a YC artist uh we have a outreach program so uh, before the concert we visit like uh, seven different elementary schools middle school high school sometimes college and even library or uh uh some some uh, elderly housing then i learned a lot that i do really well in those <laughs> So, but I know many uh, artists in the roster, they struggled because of that's a different audience. So I think um, we need to know the audience, the target audience, when you're auditioning, when you are performing for the concert and yeah, be flexible. And uh, you can announce that I'm gonna fail since you requested, I'll do it just for you. It helps. I used to do just the day requesting me, like I'm on the spot, oh, I do something and then I, I feel like, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna fail. That didn't work well. <laughs> They're like, hmm, is this a really good platform or what? <laughs> but well, when you announce like... it, they are like so cooperative. Okay, I guess she's trying just for us and it's uh, almost fun. Well, I remember, I mean, just I've seen you and I've seen you mentioned uh, another marimbist, Nani Mamura, the great Nani Mamura perform. Like I've seen both of you perform several times and it does seem like there is this ability to just like, oh, here's a tune. OK, I can I can play on this tune. I know like it's it's I, but I agree with Ben. I know that experience like, oh, yeah, if I had to if I had to hack out happy birthday right now, like. Would I miss some notes? Yeah, I probably probably would. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the best thing uh, with the kids was you ask them to come up and try to play Happy, Dur Happy Birthday or whatever the song they are requesting. Yeah, yeah, and that's what you should realize, do. Oh, you know, you Marimba, is this C? And... Yeah, look, yeah, start here. This is your first note and you just hit it. It's easy. Anyone can play this thing. Yeah, that's yes, no, that's, make that's sure a good... you place them on the highest register so they don't break the marimba. <laughs> I, I oh, do that with uh, I do that with white knuckle stroll at my kids' concerts. 
That's a good idea. That, well, that's oh, another one. Try it, kids. Just play really fast. <laughs> that's another one you miss a note. Nobody notices or cares. <laughs> and I also have a same teacher with Nanae. I was <laughs> 10 and I met the Nanae. She was 12. And who, who is that teacher for everyone in the, in the young folks? Uh, so Keiko Abe's student. So Akiko Suzuki. So she was me and Nanae's teacher. Back then, we had no idea we both were going to be Marendis, right? <laughs> but we were little kids playing around. We played a lot together, uh, same summer camp. And yeah, and uh, you know, the benefit of being a student of Keiko Abe, I can take lesson with Keiko Abe. So I was very lucky. Can you explain real quick the... Um like the teaching lineage down from Keiko Abe in Japan? Ah, so I don't think there are. Yeah, no, go ahead. So uh, the most beneficial for, uh, for me was uh, it was like a modeling experience. She will began to play. I think that was a violin piece. I was playing with the orchestra as a soloist and she began to play with the right hand leading technique and kind of loop that uh, one bar, right? And she just doesn't stop. She began to play and just when you're ready, jump in. I'm like, uh, <laughs> first of all, I'm not in that phys physiological state. You're jumping around showing, like, how do I get there? I'm like, do, 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 do more like a hands, right? Just using the basic uh, technique of using the wrist and hitting the right spot. She was somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. so, and the thing is, she doesn't give up. So I, I'm in a state that I really have to jump in or this lady won't stop. <laughs> so Keiko keep playing with the whole power I mean, just for me, then after maybe I feel like five minutes is probably one minute and a half, I began to play dun, 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 just dumb beat to feel that movement. Then she stopped me. I don't think you can get four notes with that. <laughs> I mean, she is so charismatic. And that's uh, when I know when she was playing the, the, Legs from the instruments to marimba is uh, most people are side away, but she kind of used like a forward and back, which I all I do too because of Keiko. Wow. So uh, I kind of yeah. learned that marimba playing is not just a side away motion, which most people tend to mimic, but I also mimic the like going forward and back motion with the flat keys shop keys and uh, white keys so that was very cool that's cool yeah i'll uh, i'll withhold myself because whenever keiko Abe comes up she's my favorite maroon player and i just go oh, on Steve. and on <laughs> she's so wonderful but uh naoko i wanted to ask one thing i, I saw in your bio that i've seen in uh, a, a lot of japanese marimba's bios it seems is you've performed in suntory hall and i i looked it up and it looks like a, a beautiful hall and it seems like a very prestigious place in Japan to play, but it's not something I hear too many Americans talking about. Um, could you tell us about that hall and what's so special about performing there? Ah, oh, Santori Hall is very uh, famous um, for Japanese people. And many of the famous Berlin Philharmonic and you know all the best orchestra in the world come to play. And that, uh, concert hall became very famous for having the backside audience seat. So it's like full area, like uh, LA Field have that uh, Disney hall, they have the backstage. So mm -hmm. timpani is playing, and then you can kind of watch Joe Pereira from right there. Yeah. Is he playing the right notes? You know? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, uh, by the way, Joe's, uh, I teach with him in a uh, USC stuff. So. We trust you. We trust you're nice. We know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Excellent. just a great, ex uh, great hall to. So let's say if there's a marimba performer performing, then you can see from the back view, right? Mm. 
Cool, cool. As cool, a couple, cool. of mine, I don't prefer, but as an audience, it's kind of fun. <laughs> I think it's uh, always fun. Did you oh. did you perform like a full recital there? And how did you how were you selected to perform in such a prestigious venue? Uh, I won an uh, international league of artists competition in Japan, and as a winner, I was uh, I could perform there, and I also won some uh, Italy competition. Ibla Grand Prize International Competition, and I won uh, some Marimba Special Specialist Award or something like that. So, yeah. You've won so many competitions, and I know that some young folks who um, are interested in having a performing career really hate the idea of teaching on the side. And oh. so as someone, you know, who's won everything and you've had such a fantastic career, is it possible to make a living from just performing? What do you think? Yes. Wonderful. Yes. And why, why did you choose to teach then? <laughs> I always wanted to be a teacher. I had a great teacher. I think uh, most of my students, even who said I only want to perform, the passion is a feeling, so it changes, right? So uh, when I was in 20s, uh, Nate Rosaro said, well, you know, I used to think just like you, but I want to limit myself. I, my family is my priority and not necessarily traveling to the world are not my priority anymore. Then that resonated me. I got, Back then, I had no doubt I'll be touring the world the rest of my life. Then eventually, my best friend got married. They had kids. I'm like, huh, I'm the only one single. Then I felt like maybe I want to marry. Then I didn't have the right guy, so I couldn't marry. But, you know, things happen in a way. Then I knew I wanted to be mother. Then so I guess I have... Um, like a side passion, make sure that side passion uh, grow. I know when you are competing mine, it's hard, but just be open that the passion is uh, temporary. It's just a feeling and it will change. But one thing I know is no regret, right? So when you are uh, doing it, just have a deadline. Don't have like five year plan, I don't know what, kind of plan that was that's for the side plan <laughs> uh, have a plan like one one week if your passion's high oh marimba's cool, so cool just have a boot camp of one week plan nothing but the marimba except you are in a the class then see how it goes so for me um marimba's i wanted to be marimbist then next week maybe not so much right so you, I think uh, if anyone could get from my session today is re-evaluate, re-evaluate, re-evaluate. So re-evaluating each uh, in a short term and working as soon as possible, action first, then passion follows. So knowing that rule, just act on it and re-evaluate. And also knowing uh, uh, where you are in the developmental stage is important. Like for the students, if they are younger than 25, there uh, they are three frontal cortex where you decide the tempo, uh, how, how much of accelerando and retardando is good. Their decision-making brain are still developing. So, uh, like training that part is very important. Also, the their passion gonna fluctuate. So I I'm very uh, in front. I tell them your prefrontal cortex are not good. <laughs> Sorry, you gotta work on it. You have time, yeah. So they work on. Uh, you have to know your decision probably not right, not the best. And many uh, psychologists say, oh, you shouldn't get married till 25. And that's just because of that. So your decision-making is not the best until 25. 
And the sad part is the, the prefrontal cortex, that part, gonna start to decrease its function shrink uh, around the age of 30. So it's like the last to come and the first to go. So you, your decision-making skills, uh, you really want to be, a, what do you say? Many people cannot tell your real thought. So just know that wow. so it's temporary. How do I measure mine? Because I think it's essentially gone. Is there a, a microscope. Like a microscope. <laughs> oh, I need to pick my lesson. Should I mute it? Should I mute, should I... <laughs> Carly, Ooh, I roasted. You... <laughs> yeah, this sounds horrible. Like our best decision making years are only from 25 to 30. That's um. I think that was yeah, one of my worst. Sorry, I, I kind years, of skipped the sure. whole maybe 100 hours of my reading to make it easy but uh in fact you know our brains are so smart so like superpower right here so the as long as you create a big decision making mechanism in here they began to uh other parts gonna make that happen so once you have that good decision making it will be lifetime almost there it is. Well, you know, uh, Naoko, the question that I thought Ksenia was going to ask a few a few minutes ago when she started talking about all the competitions and how that sounds like it's so such a core part of um, how you would advise young aspiring marimbis to pursue a career. I'm wondering, have you had students who don't want to do competitions? Um, and I'm thinking of, you know, there's like the bar talk quote. Um, competitions are for horses, not artists, and we all might have different feelings about that. But, you know, and I know that some people, and when I was younger, I was a little bit averse to competition because it felt like, you know, I want to I want to make art for art's sake, not to be ranked for second, third, something like that. How have you handled uh, the situations with students like that? I say don't think. <laughs> and I, for me, I was very introvert. You probably don't think so because I'm, I'm making my, uh, you know, marimbist switch on. But when I'm off, like, I'm like, nobody noticed me. <laughs> Pretty shy. So uh, for the students who have really uh, networking skills, and they're really good at using social medias, there are so many ways you can make a living by not entering competition. So don't limit to yourself if you feel that way, but you have to act on it if you want to be. I guess that's my point. Many people just say, I don't want to be a audition, but I want to be marimbis, or I want to be percussionist. I want to be a college teacher. Then they don't practice. It doesn't just happen. So I think uh, most of my advice is uh, behavioral advice. Have you blocked the refrigerator with the snare drum? Like they literally, wherever they go, you have to make it to the place to practice. And even you still can't practice. I mean, I'm sorry, but it's the wrong major. You don't have passion. You don't, the behavior doesn't work, then nothing works. So yeah, I, you, you can tell I blocked my, uh, the front door with the symbols, toilet door with the tambourine. You see a xylophone in the kitchen, the uh, Jonathan Singer. Singer. Uh, it's like that itself tells you like behavioral therapy that if it works, that's great. And if it doesn't, it's, you can tell. Uh, whatever you, you thought you want to be mermaids, you, you don't. And the percussion is that was just uh, temporary passion that's something you should pursue yeah it's it's that it's that old thing of like if you really want to be doing this you would find yourself doing it you know like you we we seem to find time to do the things we actually want to do so yes if you really want to play percussion you would f find yourself with sticks in your hands doing it um so yeah i mean that that just seems to be 100 percent consistent among successful people, you know, Colin Hill just reinforced it again a few episodes ago. It's like, yeah, you, you, you're, there, there's no way to do this uh, without, yeah, like, like actually, oh yes, I watched that. 
Yeah. And he was saying about the outlier of the, he was talking about the practice hours of the professionals. And yeah. if you want to be soloist, it's, he was talking about outlier was a high end, not the low, low end, right? So yeah. we were absolutely eight hours a day. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so yeah, the, the average he found in say is in master's degrees was something like four to five hours and the outliers that he threw out were in the like, yeah, like eight hour. They were, they were always higher with the odd yes. people out. Um, so that, that doesn't suggest you must practice eight hours, but it's, it did suggest that nobody practicing one hour a day made it, you know, nobody. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's kind of interesting. I, I, I like what you were saying earlier about like how your your career like vision and opinion and feelings will change later, um, especially like if you decide you want to be a parent or if you want to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like kind of settle down or whatever. And it just made me think if you if anyone's ever seen the, a movie called Hillary and Jackie, it's it's about the cellist Jacqueline Dupuy and her sister, who's a, a flautist. And anyway, it's very much about uh th their you know their existence in music together and uh Jacqueline Dupuy like how just her journey and how she is a soloist going all over the world doing everything but you know she's does things like leaves her cello out on her balcony hotel balcony while it's snowing in hopes just like beg that she can like get off this wild train you know this like tour and booking agents and going yet to another city of uh you know people she doesn't know and doesn't speak the language of and it just it just it's another example of like hey you know you you, you may decide you don't actually really love this you know touring lifestyle and playing th that much uh, in until you actually get get into it so i don't know it's it's, it's cool advice um our last questions yeah really on the personal side and and nauco we I, I found this out about you on our um um we were teaching at um, the American Percussion Seminar oh, together yes? this, this summer, and and I, I don't know you were entertaining some students' questions, and um, you, you mentioned that um, you've had some health hurdles, like major health hurdles that you've conquered and come back from, and I just wonder if you have any advice for people who, you know, currently can't study music because they're fighting for their health, or maybe how to bounce back the the way you have. I mean, I was really moved by what you shared. So I can share my experience. It's it also depends. It's that the physical, it's the mental. So many people go through. And my case was first. First, uh, I took a break from performing because uh, my pelvic separated, uh, giving birth to my child, and which I nobody knew such a thing existed. And after I give give birth. Uh, I couldn't stand up and everybody was like, why? Like, I, I can't, it's, it doesn't. So, uh, you know, that moment I knew oh, it will be down here. <laughs> so, uh, so I was on a wheelchair for uh, easily six months and basically I had to cancel the concerts. Then, yeah, the first time was hard. Then second child, I had the same condition because my pelvic just separated. So it's it's got back, but it's gonna separate again. So doctors uh, were saying maybe I shouldn't get pregnant. Then, uh, you know, my husband and I wanted to. So I, you know, first, first year it's impossible, I'm like, I can't do it. Then I maybe it's animal instinct or something. Even I destroy my body, I want one more for my first child. Uh, I don't know. So I decided to try. Then yes, of course, the pelvic separation happened. Now I was in pain again. But because I expected, I was so ready. And I've done it, so I was so ready. I didn't book a gig in advance, and everything was so much smoother. So um, three years ago, I got diagnosed by cancer. I just don't want to go deeper than that. But so 
I mean, it's devastating. You have a two child and I almost mm -hmm. regretting having two. Like I, I thought two was a good idea. Maybe not so good if I that. Then, um, well, I su survived kind of uh, my, uh, I'm still in a surveillance and the last check up is actually next month, uh, October. So I will be really clear the next month. Cool. Uh, but you know, if those things happen, uh, one thing I can advise is just cancel as soon as possible when you found out. I wish I knew that when I got panic, I was like so ready to go to my gig. And my doctor was like, I don't think you are understanding what I'm saying. Then, you know, over the years of performing and dedication, like counseling my concert didn't, didn't register. I'm like, it has to be after my surgery after my concert. Like, it's basically, you have to, uh, I mean, for you, if you got diagnosed and it depends thing on the cancer, but if the cancer is the really worst type, then just to have a list of the people first you tell, then cancel the first two months. You cannot go beyond that. You don't have to cancel. Then go day by day. And when I got a little better, I actually texted the pilot's channeling. Where did you get that chair to practice, Marinda? You know, <laughs> <laughs> I may need it. He, he had no clue, but he he told me where he got it, and I, you know, so I can actually start playing. Yeah. So uh, yeah, and if you yeah. are, uh, I would say one thing that helped me is. First, I tried to cancel everything. My responsibility for teaching at USC and some students who have big dream, I thought I'll just, that's too much. And I almost said I will take a break. Uh, I'm so glad I did it because I live with chronic pain right now and I take a steroid shot like four times a year and I'm still in pain. So those pains somehow when I'm teaching, like right now, I don't feel. So actually the job and the passion and that helps you. So my advice is not to cut everything and keep the things that like occupy your mind and be have a good social support. Mm -hmm. Obviously, well, it, that point, like performing the world, it's not the priority. <laughs> you should just stay on the show then. Like, if it feels good right now, just just join us. Ksenia, yeah. you can, you know, take a few episodes off or something. I'll leave. No problem. It's a good <laughs> cause. Let's have no cause to stay. Well, Naoko, that's that's so important to, to share. And thanks for doing it. And it, it's, um, you know, we've talked about um, inclusion, diversity, representation on this this show um, a lot, and I've said this statement in the past, but um, I, I feel like there's there's a lot of representation you can't see, you know, you can't, it's not in someone's skin color um, or their gender, it's, it's in trauma they've been through, like you can't see that. So it's, um, it's important to share these stories so that people who are going through it can know like, Hey, here's someone, um, who got through it and is, um, sounds like almost done with it, you know, like, mm -hmm. and you can still be successful and you can still bounce back. And, uh, yeah, even if, yeah, having your, your kids put you in a wheelchair for six months, um, <laughs> you, can, you know, you can, you can progress through that and you, you can succeed. So, I mean, it's like, I think there's like a, kind of an, an unsung, uh, representation that we, we, it's frankly harder to find unless you hear the story, you know? So yeah. thanks. Yeah. Thanks a lot. And uh, advice for the people who had to go through the health issue or mental issues, uh, is that my fear was if I'm taking this much break, I lose all the job. I didn't really. He didn't. Uh, he didn't. So yeah. when I said I'm back, I can play, then there was a job. So mm -hmm. I think what you've been doing 
will not go away because a couple of years now and then in the long run. So uh, yeah, just take a break and cool. you are still good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Carly. Naoko, thanks so much for sharing all of that. And I know it's probably not easy, but like Casey was saying, it's so important. And I think um, anybody going through major obstacles like that with health, uh, physical health, mental health, or or both, it, it's a reminder that we're human beings first and we have to take care of ourselves as such beyond you know all the musical work that we do and what we want to share. Because if we're not taking care of ourselves, we can't share well, what we have to offer musically. So thank you. Thank you, Carly. Well, I think we're about out of time, but Ksenia, do we have rapid fire questions from social media? Uh, we do, we do. I also want to say sorry before we move on, but thank you for, for sharing. And we're so happy that you are doing well and we're rooting for you next month. And thanks for being so strong. <laughs> That's so, um, sorry, I'm, I'm crying. Ah, uh, okay. So we thank go you. to, <laughs> we go to our Instagram questions. Um, the first one is from Gianmarco Petrucci drums. Uh, who asks how to propose ourselves to festivals, concerts, and live performances in general. Thanks. So if you are not like me, I, I'm pretty shy. So when I was uh, really young, I just needed the title of winning. You can see my bio, my insecurity. I just needed the <laughs> assurance then we have am I, am I good enough not sure then i enter again then that's what i see when i read I, your bio Nalco. i just think like man she is so insecure look at this i know it's like it's <laughs> insecure <laughs> she is so insecure that's it's awesome serious. I'm a, it's serious. I like it. then finally i felt confidence enough i'm good <laughs> <laughs> like a check, check, technique, check. I know Buck, check. I know contemporary, check, check, check. Am I good? Call my mom. Mom! <laughs> I mean, I guess uh, people uh, underestimate people's happiness and uh, I don't know, overestimate the people's happiness and underestimate the sadness. So I'm like, People are like, congratulations. Like, I thought all the gigs are gonna come to me, which didn't. I mean, nobody knew I win, <laughs> to be honest, in back then. So you have to tell, I want this, I want this, I want this, I want this. Social media wasn't there. So you had to say you want. <laughs> well, so you, you have to have a resume. I mean, you, you so you can't just go up to a, a producer, a conductor, and say, "Hey, I think you should feature me as a soloist." I mean, you you have no, to. No, 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 it doesn't work. So, you uh, work. You so I want to enter the competition, which manages me. So someone else gonna say she's a great booker. So yeah. anyone who's uh, like me, just get the resume ready and just target the audition. Should be the one who manages you, not the first prize. Then if you are uh, like yourself, good self promoter, just go to the competition. I'll be here. I play like this. Then just send the promo packet. I sometimes get the promo packet. Like mm -hmm. I, I'm, this is me. What do you think? That's really good. Cool, cool. Um, let's see. I think um, this other one, Ksenia, it looks like we kind of we talked about this, how to prepare for competitions long in the future. Um, so so thanks. Uh, oh, Jesse, go. Thanks for uh, thanks for uh, submitting that. And then it looks like uh, Ryan Carlisle. Hey, Ryan. He said, uh, what are the biggest challenges you faced when starting your career? And what did you do to overcome those? Hmm. I guess it's uh first couple gigs you have to do for free you just have to and when you're a student just take as many free gigs as possible so you can charge and i mean who will gonna book you if you don't have anything on your resume so uh, try to have 10 master classes in a college level before you reach to the company or if you want to be a, 
and the performance make sure you have a concerto uh, performance. Also, uh, Houston Symphony is a great one. That was my target competition. I think it's still the winning prize is like twenty thousand dollars, and you can play with the Houston. Is that the youth competition, or is there an, uh, an adult one also? I'm a hog. I'm an adult. Yeah, yes, that one. Yeah. I first time I tried, I did. I got the third prize, but that was my target competition. I have a, like some of them that's practice competition, so I do well in the target competition. So Houston Symphony, I didn't do well in the first time. Even the third prize, everybody congratulated me. I was not happy. Then I went back and won. So uh, having a practice competition is very important. And you are aware of that helps. Otherwise, your mental goes, uh, goes away. Um, so some of the students go full heart every single competition then they think their talent they are no talents like no destroy also the uh black and white thinking like uh if i didn't make it i'm no good those thinking doesn't start immediately but after 10 10 failure in a competition i i don't i shouldn't call failure but they take it to fail then that's that will lead to that thinking. So make sure when you're, you're taking that competition, is that the target competition or is the practice competition? So when you decide it's a uh, practice competition, you are just taking it. So in the target competition, you do well. So you don't get hurt. I mean, if anything, I want to get hurt now. Tell me, judge, right? Reach out to the other judge as much as you can. Get the... Mm -hmm as much critics as possible. You probably uh, cling to the one positive comment among them, but be realistic, focus on the negative. Mm. Then practice that. So this is a way to be a professional. Yeah, yep, great. great. Uh, ben, something? Yeah, I had one last kind of fun question. I saw you performed with Christina Aguilera on Jimmy Kimmel. Tell us about that. <laughs> it's one of those like pop performances where you're totally just like, eh, I'm in the background, but this is fun. <laughs> well, um, you know, I always recommend all the undergraduates to just be versatile percussionists before we choosing one specialty. That's, you know, if I didn't focus on all the snare drum and taiko and timpani and all that, I didn't have that experience. Uh, so make sure, my advice is make sure you, when you're learning a different percussion, even your passions are not there. As I told you, the passion comes after the action. So after learning, your passion goes. Understanding of the timpani will come. So just act on it. Love them all. Then Christa, uh, Christina Aguilera or any gigs are going to come to you. Then you're like, oh, sure. <laughs> it was so much fun. And I, I mean, I'm a percussionist. I sold myself as marindist, but I'm still a percussionist. Love you all. <laughs> Man, Naoko, thanks a ton for being here today. Yeah, I really appreciate Thank you it. for having me. It's always good to see you. I look forward to seeing more of you. And keep those uh, keep those family photos going on Facebook. <laughs> yeah, that's a happy moment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. Hey, well, thanks so much, everybody. Uh, ben Carly Ksenia, um, catch you later. And Naoko Takada. Thanks a ton. Yeah. Good to see you. Bye, everybody.